Thanks very much. Now, I've um, actually been here in Brighton since uh, Sunday, and um, so far, nobody has really helped find for me uh, what, what the youth bit means in the title of the conference. So, what, how to define youth? Where, where are we saying our starting ages? Where's the last age that we're um, And so, um, I've got an idea for maybe a way in which we could start to tease this out. Um, Oh, no, I do. Good. So this is just my measuring technique, perhaps, for how you tell when somebody is a youth. And um, basically, you go into any living room or lounge around the world, and you can determine infancy, childhood, youth, and maturity from the distance with which uh, somebody would watch television. <laughs> now, you might say, you might say that's not very easy, but maybe it's not very practical. Um, people watch television differently nowadays, you know, and people in different rooms. Okay, well, maybe we should try something different. Um, hopefully, um, most of you will recognise this gentleman, particularly those of you um, who did arts majors. This is William Shakespeare. And uh, in The Winter's Tale, there's a quote, I would that there were no age between 10 and 23, for there is nothing in the between than getting wenches with child, wronging the ancient tree, stealing, fighting. It's <laughs> Now, there's two, two interesting points here. One, one that I really like is the ages that he gives. Um, you may hear uh, people tell you that oh, um, puberty happens so much younger nowadays, uh, adolescence is an earlier onset thing. Um, well, Shakespeare would have you believe that at least in Elizabethan times, it was already, you know, 10 was already when people were starting to act up. And his off, offset age, 23, is really quite old. Again, people talk about this delayed adolescence that we have in modern society. Well, maybe it's not so modern. But also, look at what he's pointing out as he's going on here. Um, stealing, um, fighting, being disrespectful to your elders. Chicks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that was too, that's fine. So what's, what is going on here? So this, this, may, uh, uh, this slide or one quite like it might win the prize for the most presented image in the process. <laughs> um, basically, what we're looking at here is the incidence of different uh, classes of disorder across the lifespan. And, Focusing on this age group between 10 and 30, when there's this massive uh, increase in the uh, uh, disability caused by mental disorders. And this, of course, is um, a bit of a problem. We don't have hospitals for young people. We, we've got them down here for children, we've got them general hospitals, which tend to deal with uh, disorders of ageing, like cancer or dementia. But nothing uh, set aside specifically for young people. Um, and yet, that's clearly where huge amount of um, requirement um, for care, uh, but not, in fact not just care, I mean, if going from being uh, age 9 to being age uh, 25, there's a 2 to 300% increased rate of mortality and morbidity, so you're much, much more likely to die when you are in your 20s than when you're um, uh, in your low single figures, oh sorry, your late single figures. So what's changing through this period that makes people at risk for um, both mental disorders, but generally um, injury and death. And of course, lots of things are changing through adolescence. But I can't, I'm not going to try to talk about them all today. So there's things like um, cognitive capacity improves, people get smarter as they get older, better able to uh, uh, remember things and deal with complexity. Um, we know that um, there's changes in the social interaction as well. So um, people, uh, People in their teenage years spend far more time talking to age, um, their age match peers than they do uh, adults. And that's quite a reverse from what happens in, uh, in primary school, for example. But um, one of the things that's really quite interesting to think about is, is this upsurge of what often gets called risk taking behaviours. Um, although I'm not sure that I like the term risk taking behaviours, because most of the time young people don't do things just because they're risky, uh, young people do these things because they're fun. Um, and that's an important differentiation, differentiation to make. So you do get the, uh, people referring to this as sensation-seeking. And this kind of risk-taking, this kind of sensation-seeking, um, well, it happens across a whole range of things, but one that's quite common is uh, drug use. Now, it is experimental drug use, it's this kind of risk-taking with, um, with substances. Is it actually developmentally appropriate? Can you expect people to do this sort of thing? 
Well, in fact, if you look at um, young people who are abstainers, people who have never used uh, alcohol or drugs, they tend to be anxious people, more control, uh, and lacking social skills. And in fact, perhaps that's not so much a surprise, because if you don't know who to talk to to get the drugs from, it's going to be quite hard to actually access drugs. But if we look at frequent users, well, things aren't good with them either. Um, they tend to be more alienated and distressed with their peers and have poor impulse control. And in fact, the ones who are the most, um, the, the best adjusted are the experimental users. They are more socially competent, and they're more, they were more socially competent when they were children, not just now, as adolescents. So we would expect there to be some sort of normative uh, ex um, experiment, uh, experimenting with the world and taking those risks. And in fact, that's what we see in uh, other animals as well, both in, in rats, uh, which are uh, adolescent rats, are more likely to explore further from the nest, um, or in non-human primates, uh, adolescent male primates take longer leaps through the canopy, for example. So this kind of risk-taking is a normal developmental process. Now, I do want to talk about drugs during adolescence, though, because I don't want you to get the sense that I think, oh, well, you know, because it's normal, therefore everything must be fine. And quite a lot of work done, some in humans, but um, here, as you can see uh, in this slide, in some animal populations as well, um, where uh, people have investigated the impact of drugs on the adolescent as opposed to the adult. Now those of you who uh, were out drinking last night, uh, if you're above the age of 25, uh, you might have noticed that you just can't really drink quite as much as you used to before you really, you want to just go home and go to bed. And, and getting up in the morning is all, an awful lot harder. Well, that's a feature of the adolescent response to, to a lot of toxins. Adolescents are more resistant to heat, uh, cold, hunger, and to a lot of the sensitive effects of alcohol, for example. But at the same time, the adolescent brain can be more sensitive to other features. So for example, um, it's quite hard to get adult animals addicted to nicotine. You have to get them uh, started when they're quite young. But nicotine can also be toxic to brain cells um, in, uh, in, in the young animal. Uh, same is true for alcohol, which seems to have a, a, a you know, more uh, aggressive impact on regions of the brain involved in memory in young people. So, although um, as a, a young person you might be, uh, if you like, insulated against the uh, passing out uh, impact of uh, alcohol or falling over, perhaps, it still can be damaging your brain. So, what sorts of models have been put forward to try to explain? these changes in behavior during adolescence. This is a very um, uh, popular model. And although in more recent years it started to become a bit more complex, I think the general tenor of it still holds. But there are two different developmental processes going on during adolescence. That when you, when you go into adolescence, which is really a process associated with puberty, the, the, the increase of sex hormones around, around puberty, and what you see as a result is increased emotional um, arousability. You tend to see this increase in sensation seeking and perhaps some changes in what people find rewarding. And, and then, so you have this middle adolescent period when you've got a bit of vulnerability because you have all of this drive, but in fact you don't yet have the regulatory abilities. You can't necessarily uh, control your impulses as well as an adult can. Because it's when the frontal lobes mature later in adolescence that you start to get better at being able to take a step back saying, maybe I don't want to do that, or control your anger, or whatever it might be. Now, I just want to start by talking about this idea of change reward then in adolescence. This is a, a functional brain <coughs> scan um, of a task where um, basically it was an opportunity to win money. It was going to, uh, uh, you were told a little light's going to flash up on the screen, and if you can press the button before the light goes away, then you might win money, or perhaps lose money. So the, the, the bit that the researchers were interested in was that gap between being told you could win money here and actually having to press the button. So these areas in yellow that you can see on this scan are um, from um, the adults that took part in the study. And this area that's active in response to thinking 
there's a chance to win money here. Uh, an area of threat known as the Vector Strait is strongly involved in uh, reward sensitivity and reaction to reward. Any ideas about what the adolescence can look like? Doing exactly the same terms here. Will the show How many people think that the adolescents are actually going to show massive amounts of activation? How about less activation? Um, it's less, is the answer. So what we're seeing here is that when, in this study at least, when adolescents were told, you know, just have to work quickly to win money, you know, I'm not that bold. Now, I should point out that you know, more, more recent uh, research has suggested it's not quite as simple as saying adolescents just don't care about you know, working for money. That's not quite, that's not the easy way. But it is certainly true that, um, that young people have a, have a different responsivity to reward, a different, a different um, uh, central uh, response to winning or losing. Because it's not always about money, as I'll talk, to you, talk about later. Because um, as you get older, you actually start to um, lose grey matter. And um, it's, I always find it somewhat um, uncomfortable to think that uh, you have to become an adult by actually getting rid of bits of brain. So all teenagers actually have more grey matter than adults do. Uh, and this, these slides here are just demonstrating the way in which that pattern of um, development happens and how and, uh, which of the last areas to, to mature. So areas that are blue are adult levels. And this is a, um, this, these um, videos are showing from age 4 to about age 21. And what's impressive is just how slow and uh, long it takes to reach adult levels of cortical thickness. So it is a long maturing process, this regulatory confidence. So you've got this change in reward and then a slow change in regulatory confidence that's related to this cortical thinning. Okay. So, but the thing about risk-taking behaviours is, um, is, is that teenagers know what's risky. That this doesn't make much sense. You know, if you go into a class uh, of 14 and 15 year olds and you say, um, you know, what are some things that are risky? You know, would, you, uh, would you jump off a, a cliff into uh, water and you don't know how deep the water is? I say, oh no, wouldn't do that, that would be quite risky. Um, what about um, uh, hanging on to the back of a tram to go down to the street in Melbourne? That, would you do that? Oh no, that, that's very risky. You wouldn't do that either. Um, so, young people almost always know the right answers, and that's because cognitively they're um, developing very rapidly, and they understand what is a risky behaviour and what's a non-risky behaviour. But in fact, that doesn't really seem to stop risk-taking behaviours at all. Why should that be the case? I'm just going to talk about um, a particular study that I found really quite compelling. This is a um, and, and this study is actually looking at driving and, and risk taking during driving with this particular um, computer aids task. So your aim is to start here, and you're going to drive all the way along here until you reach the end. And there are 20 of these intersections with traffic lights that you're going to come on. This is what it looks like here. And every time you come out to the traffic light, you have to make a decision. Because the aim is to get here as fast as you can. Yeah? So are you going to stop at the traffic light? Because, well, it is. It is amber, so you, it's the same warning. Or are you going to go straight through? If you stop, then you get a short delay, so that's not great. But if you go, then you might be lucky and get through and just and be able to keep driving. But alternatively, you might actually crash and you end up with a, a six second delay. So the aim is to see well, what's going to happen to people here uh, when they have to do this task. Who, you know, uh, adults like to believe they're incredibly safe drivers and they're never hit anything at all, so you know, the adults should do really well. Um, young adults, so university students, maybe a little bit more risky, and we expect the, the mid-teenagers to be very risky indeed. But actually, that's not the trick here, because this task was done twice. Once on, on your own, with people just on their own, and a second time when they had their friends sitting behind them, like they were in the back seat of the car, um, shouting advice, that sort of thing. So what's going to happen here? So here are our results. Um, here on this, this bar here, you see levels of risky driving, and, and higher is worse. Here. What you should be able to see is you know, a nice age-dependent decline in risky driving. But what's particularly interesting is this interaction 
between the presence and absence of peers. So for, for young adolescents, if you're trying to do this task and you've got your friends with you, then you're far, far more likely to be taking risks than if you're doing it on your own. And although you can see a similar sort of pattern in the young adults, um, it's not there at all by the time you reach late 20s. Well, that's quite a surprise. Now, we've um, actually asked um, some of our participants why this might be. Um, and they said, although they're more in the young adult range, they report just generally feeling more confident in their decisions uh, when they're with their peers. They just generally feel more likely that they're going to going to make the right selection. And yet, of course, um, very often they don't. Um, you know, in, in fact, this is, this is a brain that in some respects is actually out of control. Uh, this is actually a, this is a graffiti that I found in, uh, in Sydney one, one, one morning walking through. Um, and, um, and it suggests you know, that, that we, could, we could spend as long as we like trying to educate about driving safety or indeed any other area where we think there might be risk. Um, but it may not necessarily have any impact at all on young people. Not because they don't understand that, that is risky, but because in the context when they make these risky choices, they're not actually thinking that you know, anything negative can happen to them. They feel more confident, they generally feel uh, more positive about uh, themselves and their friends. And so it's quite hard to, um, for an, an educational effort to make any difference there. Some things just take time to mature. And this sort of decision making might be Okay. I just want to uh, finish then with this same task of looking at where it might affect the brain. So here, this is now a functional imaging task with the same peers, no peers task. And here, what you can see is that uh, as you get older, your frontal lobes mature. That's what I was indicating before. So you just generally get a little bit better at stopping yourself. But when we look at the interaction with age and whether your peers are watching or not, what do we see come out? Central straight, same reward region again. Look at the interaction for the young adolescents. So what they're finding is that taking risks while their peers are watching is really very rewarding. It's you know they they're getting a lot of buzz out of risk taking with peers, and far less than when they're on their own. So it just suggests that actually teenagers are thinking more about social reward than, for example, financial reward. They're offering money. I want to finish with this last slide, and I like, I like this slide because I tend, I tend to get when we talk, certainly for me, uh, as no longer a young person, uh, it can sometimes feel like talking to or at young, young people rather than talking with them. I think we, we should all try to uh, remind ourselves just how much we've got in common. Uh, we might wear our pants at different heights, uh, but we both like the same pants.